yes sir you can start now good evening everyone we welcome you all to ortho tv online in association with zydus this is the master class 2 spine symposium virtual of the four mega events which are going to be held live virtual ortho academicia 2021 to introduce today's speakers and topic i hand over to dr salim patel thanks dr neeraj uh, welcome to all our delegates uh, to this master class 2 of virtual ortho academicia for the spine symposium we have a galaxy of uh, faculties lined up today with excellent case discussions in the field of spine so without wasting much time i would straight away go on to uh, the introduction of our panelists today uh, the first one uh, in the order of uh, presentation the first is going to be uh, dr agnivesh tikku from mumbai he is a consultant spine surgeon at the apollo hospital navi mumbai an ao spine international fellow he has done a, also a fellowship in cardiff in uk has been in the uh, the national board fellow in the spine surgery at the induja hospital from mumbai i welcome dr agnivesh on this platform welcome dr agnivesh the next is uh, dr shah waliullah from lucknow he is a consultant spine surgeon and an associate professor at the king george medical university in lucknow with special interest in spine tuberculosis and spine deformity correction welcome dr shah waliullah thank you next is dr ajay kothari from pune uh, fellow as well as a dear friend of mine a consultant spine surgeon from sancheti hospital he has been the member of the ao spine swiss and also specializes in minimal invasive spine surgeries welcome ajay to the platform coming to our seniors uh, dr mahendra koshal sir he is the chairman and medical director of the trinity hospital and medical research institute in arthroscopy and spine endoscopy center chandigarh sir has served in the medical wing at the indian air force pgi and the gmc at chandigarh He has done his fellowship in France in 2013 in endoscopic spine surgeries. Has popularized the arthro spine system in 2004, and has been a life member of very reputed organizations, including the World Endoscopic Spine Society. I welcome Mohinder Koshal sir on this platform. Welcome, sir. Next, sir, Dr. H S Chhabra sir, a chief spine, uh, a spine service and medical director of the Indian Spinal in uh, Injury Center. He has been the president of the Indian Spinal Cord Society 2018 and 20, the president of the ASSI, board member of the International Group of Advancement in Spine uh, Sciences, and also a council member of the International Spine Spinal Cord Society. Welcome, Dr. Chhabra sir, to the platform. And last but not the least, Dr. Ram Chadda sir, a senior consultant spine surgeon at the Leelawati Jaslok and Global Hospital, Mumbai. Sir has been the past president of the Bombay Spine Society, the Bombay Orthopedic Society, and the ASSI. The council member of the APOA, he has pioneered the minimally invasive cosmetic spine surgeries in India, and has multiple fellowships in Germany, USA, and South Korea in the field of spine. With this, I welcome all our uh, faculties for this platform. Welcome Ramchandra sir to this platform. And now I would like to hand over the session to Dr. Agni Vishtiku, who will start with the first presentation. that is about osteoporosis and parkinsonism over to you dr agnew uh thank you very much dr salim thank you ortho tv and thank you zaidus for this opportunity to participate in the case discussion so we'll be discussing a case on osteoporotic vertebral fracture in a patient who had parkinsonism so the clinical details of the patient go like this that she is a 50 year 8 year old female known case of hypertension and parkinsonism she has to take support to walk she is affected by parkinsonism and has a history of fall 6 weeks ago she was given conservative treatment medicine bed rest but hasn't worked she continued to sort of mobilize despite pain and now she has severe dorsal lumbar pain which is making her bed bound the power in lower limbs is uh, less the right side is more affected than the left side there is a element of parkinsonism also but the right lower limb is definitely 3 by 5 on mrc left lower limb is 4 by 5 she has urinary urgency she is bed bound she is using diapers uh she is not very sure about the continence however the bowel control looks okay and these are the mris this is the sagittal mri of the patient so 
I would at this point of time request Chhabra sir to uh, pitch in and give his thoughts that sir, once you see this patient in the ER with a neurological weakness and comorbidities and her gait has been previously affected, what are the thoughts which go in your mind when you think about the planning for this patient? Amongst the first thoughts, I would also want to reconfirm whether there is any impending bowel or bladder involvement. So I would also see a perianal sensation and a voluntary con anal contraction in this patient. Uh, nonetheless, because the patient has neurological deficit, I would want to confirm once again that this deficit is because of uh, the impingement of the bony fragments on the cord rather than sometimes you can have uncontrolled Parkinsonism, which can also present in a similar manner. So I would want to try to assess in order to ensure that the deficit is due to the vertebral compression. Of course, we have an MRI correlation which suggests that uh, this may be the cause and the neurological deficit, I believe, has gradually progressed after the fall. And uh, 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 so uh, in this patient, uh, I would also consider doing a dynamic X-ray or an MRI under supervision in order to ensure that uh, the, there is a definite instability at that level, which is contributing to the deficit per se. Also, because uh, Parkinsonism and osteoporosis go hand in hand, and this happened after a trivial fall, so I would get a DEXA scan done and also work the patient over for, say, like a serum electrophoresis and other things because of the type of compression that is there to rule out myeloma or other secondary causes of osteoporosis in this patient. But it is well established that uh, like for other neurological diseases, Parkinsonism patients have a higher incidence of osteoporosis. Right. Thank you very much, sir. Great insights. Uh, can I ask Ram, sir, in, Ram, sir, in these difficult situations, uh, how do you assess the patient and differentiate whether it is pure Parkinsonism or there is a neurological element also involved? Well, two things I would do um, besides the complete workup, which Dr. Chabra has mentioned, which is fantastic. I would do, as he rightly said, a supervised sitting and uh, lying down lateral shoot through film, which will give me an idea whether there's an opening and closing. I would also check the neurology of this lady, which is incomplete, whether it changes between sitting for some time and lying down. The other thing which I would do is check the whole spine screening of this lady. And if there is an opening and closing, which I suspect there will be, I would also request my radiology department to do a local CT of that area to give me an idea of how crushed that one vertebra is and whether I have the option of doing something in a contained Kamal sign within it or not, just to plan my way forward. I would be consenting this lady for an intervention sooner or later. I would understand she has Parkinsonism, so she would need to be explained very, very clearly that whatever I may do may not work as well in patients with non-Parkinson picture. And I may need to do a longer construct if I'm doing something in her with probably cement augmentation to a larger extent with probably additional wires below the laminae, everything together. Once I've seen the BMD DEXA, of the spine, hips, and the forearm. Right. So uh, this is the BMD DEXA score. Definitely, it is showing osteoporosis. The other workup for uh, myeloma and the blood test, they did not reveal any other pathological finding. Unfortunately, she was too painful that she was not uh, sort of uh, willing to sit or she was not cooperative. And Parkinsonism also has an emotional component. So she would start crying when you would try to... Uh, sort of try to move her forcefully or repeatedly ask to examine and all. So that was a challenge. So unfortunately, I do not have the sitting supine x-rays, but yes, it was matching. The tenderness was there and it was a fresh fracture which had sort of uh, collapsed. So may I ask at this moment to Dr. Mahindra 
Koshal sir. Sir, do you think that Parkinsonism poses additional challenge for the implants to hold and sort of give a stable uh, fixation? Of course, you see, uh, as you have shared the DEXA uh, scan of this lady, and she's severely osteoporotic. So it is surely a very different scenario than a normal case where osteoporosis is not there. And since this lady has a Parkinsonism also, I will always carry on board my neurology uh, neurology friend also, who with his inputs also. And surely if you are planning to fix uh, this uh, case, fix a fracture, surely as uh, Dr. Ram has said, so you have to plan few segments above and few segments below, and maybe you have you you, you have to use, you may have to use a special kind of screws which are now available in the market, which can uh, really uh, address the osteoporosis part also and will increase the hold of the screws. Right. Thank you very much, sir, for your insights. So, may uh, can I involve Dr. Ajay Kothari in this and ask Dr. Ajay Kothari when? we say that we need to get more sort of fixation levels or more segments than a normal fracture. What would you think would be ideal? Like two up, two down or three up, three down? Would you consider anterior augmentation? So what are the thoughts going on in your mind at that point? So Agmivesh, I would definitely not think of having an anterior approach. I would do everything from the back. So here in this case, I would like to splint longer. And I would use uh, cement augmented versus HA coated screws versus dual core versus uh, larger diameter screws, maybe 7, 7.5 mm. So I would go three about three below in this particular case. And uh, as discussed, once you, you know, make the patient prone and take a lateral x-ray, if adequate opening is seen, I think that's a very good sign. And under control guidance, we can inject cement. Of course, there is a retropulsion which is seen. So I think it's a relative contraindication. So it depends upon, you know, once you make the patient prone, uh, you know, how the body behaves versus just quickly going and taking the body out from back and packing a, ca a cage from the back in order to, you know, support the uh, fusion construct. So I would go three about three below. I would do a PVCR from the back quickly versus maybe just, uh, you know, packing cement with a very high viscosity level. Right. So Dr. Shah Valiola, can I get you at this point of time? And uh, uh, can you can you sort of tell us why this fracture is not suitable for a vertebroplasty alone? And it's a simple procedure, can be done under local, not much of comorbidity. But would you choose that procedure in this case? Dr. Shah, are you with us? Sorry. Right. So then in that case, I'll go back to uh, Chabra, sir. Oh, okay. I'm here. Chabra. I'm here. I'm here. Right. Right. So as, as we see in this case that the posterior wall is getting fractured and it is impinging the cord as this patient is getting involved in the neurology. So definitely this patient requires a, a open procedure or because the decompression is required. And, uh, and as uh, already said by Dr. Kothari, that on seeing, on patient, on taking patient, this patient, and on seeing uh, that the lateral X-ray, whether this patient uh, has getting opened up this vertebra or not, if this uh, vertebra is not getting opened up. So I feel like uh, maybe we'll augment with this screw, uh, with this cage anteriorly, that would be a better choice for this patient. Because cement augmentation, or you can do with a con in controlled cement uh, augmentation for this fracture. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Shah. So uh, can I go back to Chabra sir and ask, sir, that, sir, do you think that doing a heart shield is much simpler in this case and not sort of get into too much of cement augmented and dual core and sort of uh, fenestrated screws? Does heart shield work better in these cases or that is not the primary choice? It's sort of a reserve if your primary surgery fails. No, hard shield is a good option, especially it keeps the cost lower and especially because, uh, see, the cortical hold of the bone is good and uh, so it may work. But the uh, problem is that it may cause a flat back. So we prefer generally to use cement augment augmented pedicle screws. Uh, we can even supplement that better with bands or transverse process hooks or other things if we feel that is required. And the larger the size of the screw and broader the size of the screw, the better. And 
we would also try to have a bicortical purchase wherever possible depending it sometimes with a dexa score like this you get a good hold on the bone you are not worried but it all depends on the feel that you have on the operation table with which you decide the second thing i would want to point out i agree that uh, the breach in the posterior contact uh, cortex is a relative contraindication for cement augmentation in that bone but you can always if the uh, if it opens out well and if there is a sufficient cancellous margin between the end plate you can always do what you will call a axial procedure in which you just inject some cement put in a balloon inflate it under supervision anteriorly and once that uh, dries out you take that out and you fill the cement in that axial that you create that prevents a posterior leak to take place so in this patient because the i i can't see very well but i don't anticipate a lot of cancellous bone between the end plate and the uh, 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 i see a deficiency so i fear that if we put in a cement it may become loose i may prefer to put in a cage especially since the patient also has a deficit but that decision will take place on the table seeing the cm image Uh, in the uh, in the position and also seeing the feeling the bone as we go in and decompress so all that will be taken into consideration one other thing that you had asked about how do you rule out between parkinsons and uh, uh, neurological deficit due to osteoporosis maybe uh, worsening of other symptoms in the upper limbs and speech may be contributor maybe Uh, pointers towards aggravated parkinson so you have to keep your eyes here and ears open and try to assess properly right thank you so much sir so interest of in interest of time what uh, i will just sort of move forward and this is what we did uh, thicker screws uh, no cement the uh, uh, the vertebral body opened up beautifully in the uh, lying down position and this is what we did three up and two down with an anterior augmentation ram sir your critical comments on the same i will say my prayers and pray both for the patient and the surgeon and i am hopeful that this should settle down but with the parkinson patient i always counsel them that we should be a little bit concerned that you may develop an adjacent segment proximally or distally but to me this looks good right right so what happened after two two months is that she tripped over a cord had a fall again she sort of uh, fractured her uh, shoulder joint and also had some other injuries the spine x rays look good so we send her back home but after two months she presents with weakness in the legs with a collapse of the lower segment she, her she has got a partial foot drop on the left side again pain in sitting need support and needs help mohinder sir your uh, thoughts on the same what should be done in this case uh in first uh, uh, first time you did, this was a open procedure am i right yes yes sir open procedure so you did a good decompression and then you put in the cement and put in the screws so now again i think she need to be evaluated again if these are titanium screws i'll go in for a fresh mri to see the status how much is the canal compromise and uh, what's going on there and then we i have to plan my further uh, course of action right right so uh, dr ajay uh, quick comments from your side i think at this point i would really like to know what is her medical condition now you know what was her ambulatory status after the first surgery was she a household ambulator was she doing all her adls on her own and i think we really need to assess her general condition for our of course if she is physiologically fine medically okay said do an mr scan and then take a wiser decision and put her on very strong anti osteoporotics i think that is one additional thing right so dr shah baliola what uh, what would be your choice of anti osteoporotics in this one 
Uh, I would like to take a, in evaluate initially with the medical before going to the medical treatment, like just some basic investigation, like uh, PTH and everything, like endocrinology burka. Then afterward, I would like to take up my this patient on Danosumab uh, along with the teriparatide, both. Right. So this patient was already on teriparatide. Uh, coming back to uh, Chabra, sir, sir, you are uh, the planning for this case. Her pain is getting better now, but she has a partial foot weakness and the patient is still not ambulatory. Her ambulation was restricted to washroom, which again is stopped now. She's using a chair. Remote. What would be your uh, thoughts on this one? So I would want to see a dynamic X-ray, uh, probably also a dynamic MRI and see if there is an impingement per se. So this uh, is grossly unstable, as you can see. The, uh, there is a retropulsion of the bone, and we expect that because there is a bigger column above, which is there. So I would uh, not hesitate in extending the uh, fixation. OK. Thank you, sir. Ram, sir, if we extend the fixation, what would be your levels? You will end at uh, L5, you will end at S1, or you will go to pelvis? Then. Well, I'll be very frank with you. This lady is, is a difficult situation any which way. So I am going up to S1 for sure. And considering what we are expecting in the lady, adding one sided into the sacrum, into the across the uh, pelvis on one side may be beneficial. But as I said, this is a, a revision surgery. So we would have to go in a very, very sort of planned out, phased out manner. We would yeah, augment the teriparatide, maybe read literature and find out whether teriparatide and tetosumab can be combined and look at Parkinsonism drugs to be improved further. All that put together and move ahead. But a fresh MRI to tell us what to do at the L4. Right. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, what we did was we augmented the anti-osteoporotics, like we added the denosumab in this case because there was no other option. The uh, patient refused any intervention. Uh, her son did not want to any. They just continued physiotherapy and exercises and all that at home, whatever in-bed exercises they could do. And patient presented after six months uh, with a completely healed X-ray, which is just a bridging osteophyte and there is no movement on dynamic X-rays. I think the nature did the best job, what probably we also could not have done. Very good result. But Dr. So Adhivesh, why did you go in for MRI? I mean, uh, there was a fracture down below and you said there was a foot drop. How you yes, can, yes, uh, I mean, uh, I, I'm sure you must have done MRI. No. Uh, sir, her son, her family members refused to sort of go ahead for any intervention oh. at that point of time. They were not no, waiting. They just said, we want to take her home and continue whatever we want to do at home only. Intervention but, is a second part or first is the evaluation. Because these patients, they may create problems later on. That's why uh, my patient was not investigated properly. You see, they don't opt for surgery. That is fine. But just getting the MRI done is not a big deal to my mind. No, I understand, sir. We I had advised the same thing along with the new CT scan and all that. But they took a call. They took her home. The only okay. good thing which they did was they just continued with the anti-osteoporotic treatment. So, so now at nine months follow-up, she was mobile, ambulatory. Yes, she was mobile, sir. She was again going to washroom and she had improved. I mean, it's Great. just nature doing its job. So good not to be very aggressive then. <laughs> okay, the only point that we, uh, uh, you, of course, you brought that out, that osteoporosis treatment needs to be given a full thrust along with managing the fracture, but also that a brace very often helps in preventing adjacent segment and in Parkinson's, where they're especially prone to fall, we have to counsel regarding fall, fall prevention. So that, that becomes very important. Yes, yes. So, so that we regularly do within the hand railing and the soft padding on the floors and all. We do follow that. Also. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Agnivik, one question for you. Yeah. Uh, it's about uh, the anti osteoporotic treatment. What would be your preference? A sequential therapy in anti osteoporotic drugs, or would you like to have a combination like teriparatide with denosumab? Teriparatide would be the first choice. I would only add denosumab in patients who are at very high risk or somewhat uh, 
somewhat with the refractory patients. It will not be my first choice. We are now sort of having early results in the patients. It is the combination is working good. But again, it will be reserved for a refractory or a sort of a, this critical type of a situation than trying it on the first attempt. I think, can I make a comment? Uh, I think the current consensus about managing this uh, severe osteoporosis is sandwich therapy as said. And I think the bone bridging that we saw, the severe, you know, a good amount of fusion construct, uh, autofusion, I would say, bridging syndesmophytes. I think it is by virtue of uh, denosumab. Because if we see in GCT, the drug of choice is denosumab. And you give denosumab maybe two doses, three doses, and you see complete, complete, complete sclerosis of the lytic lesion of the GCT. So I think uh, combination therapy of uh, denosumab and teriparatide, I think it does wonders. Right, right. Okay, thanks. Thanks, sir. Thank you. So now we go on to Dr. Shah Valiola. Yeah, he's already shared his screen. Over to you, Dr. Shah. Okay, uh, very warm. Good evening to everyone. So uh, uh, my topic is again a very common topic, but there are certain all as all we operate TB and every time like in every OBD we get one case of TB. So I'm going to uh, discuss one special situation. So this is the case that she's a 22 year old female that was referred. We got a call from Department of Ops and Gynae uh, because the patient has complained of gradual weakness in both lower limbs. So patient has 30, 34 weeks of term pregnancy and she was admitted in prenatal care ward. And patient had a history of off and on fever from last six months along with a back pain, but she was not evaluated for that thing. So on getting this patient, we examined and patient has diffused tenderness over back and there was severe spasm and she was not able to move at all. Neurologically, she had a power of two by five, two by five at three by five at the foot and uh, knee, foot and ankle and with both lower limb, but the sensations are intact and the bladder bowels is also normal. So, so the case is now open. So what's going to be the next? So I would like to invite uh, Dr. Agnivesh. So on uh, seeing this neurology, so what's coming in your mind and how you are going to proceed for this patient as she is a pregnant female, she is 34, uh, th 34 week term pregnancy. So what's coming in your mind, what going the patient is going to have and how you are going to investigate this patient. So uh, I think that if this case is a, of a pregnant female, the first thing is to sort of get in touch with the obstetrician who's taking care of the patient, discuss with them that what is the clinical scenario. Usually MRI is not a contraindication in third trimester. It's a relative contraindication in first trimester where it can cause some ophthalmic defects or some other defects. So if possible, I would think of doing an MRI with the consent of or obstetrician rather than doing x-rays and subjecting the child to radiation. But obviously, this will be something which will be in collaboration with the obstetrician who will be treating the patient. Yeah, sure. Same way we did, like uh, we take the concern after taking consent from the patient and discussing everything. And, uh, and we found that MRI is safe in second and third trimester. And as you have already said, that uh, they are relative contraindication only for the contrast MRI in first trimester. And without contrast, it is also safe in, even in the first trimester. So we did this MRI for this patient. So now, they are, as we see, there's a, uh, there's a double lesion. So now I would like to invite Dr. Kothari. So how you are going to deal with such patient as this patient is having neurological deficit? So what's coming in your mind? So is the two lesion that, uh, which lesion is responsible for this neurological deficit? Are you going to operate this patient or what, what's coming in your mind? Would you, what would you like to do with this patient? This is uh, Dr. Valiula, can you just uh, come back with the neurology? What is the neurology? Sorry, I missed neurology it. Neurology was a two by, uh, two by two and three by, uh, three, by three in ankle and foot. Ankle but and the bladder bowel is normal. Okay, and there is hyperreflexia? Yes, upper motor neuron signs are there, but there are some like uh, upper motor neuron signs are there, but bladder bowel is intact still. Okay, okay. Can we go back to the MRI images? So I think the thoracic uh, lesion seems to be the you know important one. Of course, I would like to have a closer look. Uh, I would like to study the axials. Uh, I would like to study the CT scans as well. But the CT scan we can't do for this patient because she is like a pregnant. She's a special situation there. We have only MRI for this okay. patient. Can we run through? Can we run through all the images? 
this is a dorsal and number both are here yeah, the upper one this is a dorsal as we see this is a axial uh, this is a sagittal image this is a uh, warm the baby hair and uh, axial images are there all right okay all right so now uh, definitely this is a very catch 22 situation wherein uh, theoretically this demands a surgery in view of severe cord compression and in view of neuro deficit this uh, looks like cox uh, clinico radiologically and uh, i think there are two ways of treating this the first way is doing a biopsy and uh, treating the patient with antibiotics because we've seen even patients on clonus recovering completely with tuberculosis given this special situation so that's the first treatment option and then second treatment option is in consultation with the obstetrician and the physician anesthetist having a joint meeting and proceeding with the surgery as to you know how uh, safe the surgery is in view of the pregnancy so i think uh, all these things they need to be taken into consideration so so i would like to invite dr mohinder so uh, if we are planning for surgical management especially for this female with a like uh, baby is there so what do you think how you are planning how how to do how to perform this surgery in uh, this pregnant female so is there any experience from the senior faculty please enlighten us so uh, you see okay uh, first is as uh, my colleague has mentioned we have presumed that this is a carry spine with the neurology uh, out there and uh, and she is pregnant also surely my physician friend will be on board with me to discuss the course of action i'll put her on attd now you are straight be ask me what will be your uh, surgical approach for this patient i mean otherwise if given a choice maybe i'll start her on attd wait for two months till she delivers keep, keep her on bed rest and then i may plan further intervention as one of my colleagues has mentioned ki patient with even grade 4 uh, paraplegia they have recovered beautifully with the att so but here scenario is different so my personal approach will be to wait to start conservative conservative to conserve her for two months and if she is recovering i'll continue conservative treatment and then i'll go in for surgery now you ask surgical decompression now the compression is primarily in the dorsal uh, region and i will go in for a Uh, minimal invasive uh, thoracoscopic approach, and I am in, I am using this approach regularly in my practice from open to minimal invasive plus endoscopic assisted, and I will do a decompression and stabilize the spine anteriorly if that much pressure is there on me to go in uh, as a emergency. Otherwise, I will like to hold back and try wait for uh, uh, delivery to take place and then plan further course of action. So my plan one will be conservative but if you ask me ki what surgical uh, approach i will have i will have minimal invasive thoracoscopic approach thanks a lot sir for your uh, for your views uh, we agree with your uh, first choice because we discussed with the obstetrician and uh, they advise if the surgical decompression is necessary then they can hasten up delivery they can they can uh, do like pre term uh, de delivery for this patient then we discussed with our anesthetist and everything then they said uh, there is no hurry because we have planned this patient then we decided to go for the ultrasound ultrasound guided aspiration for the to do the biopsy for this patient because we cannot do like ct guided or fluoroscopic guided in this patient because the position Uh, there is one issue with the position how to make a position for this patient so we decided to go for the conservative treatment so we did ultra ultrasound guided aspiration and uh, unfortunately it was like uh, there was no yield in that material so we have started empirical basis uh, att and patient was discharged from department of option gynae with advice to be get operated to our side after two weeks of delivery but unfortunately because of the covid pandemic this patient was not able to get us and she was not able to be get operated she was very poor and she tried to contact so much uh, so many hospitals but uh, she was not able to be get operated because of the cost and there were several constraint because of the covid pandemic so now she came back after a four months after the this covid pandemic and she came back with a bilateral lower limb flexion deformity at the knee and uh, she was having paraplegia and flexion she is she is like power is getting zero and uh, and these are the x rays the deformity like d5 vertebra has got completely collapsed 
and there's also deformity has increased at the dorsal lumbar junction so we did fresh mri uh, these are the x rays for the knee there is a bilateral knee flexion deformity that this patient is having because of the paraplegia and flexion their uh, limbs are getting so much spastic and this is a fresh mri so now i would like to uh, take a view from dr chavla sir sir how to proceed for this patient because right now we have two problems as one is the position making because of the flexion deformity at the knee and uh, both over limb and what's going to be the our treatment protocol so we would like to go for at the both level or a single level so please sir enlighten us for this case so my yeah. video she has delivered now how how long has it been since you visited first so she is like a four months after the form she came back after the four month of delivery and she is on regular att but uh, she is not responding at the team and she has uh, deteriorated neurologically and uh, she is now having paraplegia and flexion so can i just make a comment on what i would have done had the patient come to me at 34 weeks we have published such a case also okay so i agree that with the, the power that she had you could give conservative treatment a trial but you have to monitor to ensure that the deficit is not worsening if the deficit is worsening you can go in for a surgery because at 34 weeks the lungs mature and you give a steroids also to mature the lungs and but the only thing is positioning you rather than putting the patient prone you would do the surgery in a lateral position what we did was we went trans thoracic we decompressed because you don't need lot of radiation we decompressed we put a graft and we put one screw above one below put in a rod and stabilized and the patient recovered well this is what we have published of course you have to work like a team the anesthetist need to give a suitable anesthesia the obstetrician needs to be there and you need to have fetal monitoring through the surgery there is a risk that the patient will the child will uh, get delivered prematurely but at 34 weeks the the chance of any mortality for the patient is significantly reduced normally you would wait till 33 or 34 weeks if the if the patient is younger so we have done it also in spinal injury patients and it to work the patient now that the patient has come now has come to you now and with a complete paraplegia i would try to assess again and see what is the sensory level if the sensory level corresponds with the thoracic level and everything corresponds with that i because so tubercular spine is still a forgiving disease i would assess if there is any perianal sensation or a voluntary anal contraction if there is there if it is there there is still a good chance of recovery but even otherwise i would give a patient a fair chance by uh, fixing and decompressing at the thoracic level at the lower level if the x ray suggests that there is a significant deformity i could uh, i and if the dynamic x ray suggests that it has fused by now i might leave that also my aim would be to uh, try to achieve a decompression to give the patient a chance depending on what is the neurological correlation in that patient but uh, both of them can be done simultaneously if you have problems in positioning of the patient uh very often stretching in these patients can help in correct correction of some flexion deformity but you can do it in the lateral position in this patient the surgery as well so that that should not be an issue thank you sir 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 ram sir next i would like to invite dr ram sir sir what's going to be a management protocol this this patient neurology is coinciding with the dorsal spine lesion so what's going to be the management for this patient would like to go like anterior reconstruction for this patient or uh, everything from posterior well frankly frankly dr saab ayulla i'd like to see axial cuts yes. i'd like to convince myself first that my surgery today where i alter the anatomy can translate into alteration of physiology so i first need to be convinced that the patient has genuine mechanical compression if the patient does have genuine mechanical compression wherever the patient has genuine mechanical compression whether it is upper and or lower 
I shall do a decompression and stabilization, but with a very guarded result. That's first. Second, I would totally agree with what Dr. Chabra said. At 34 weeks, elective cesarean section is one option if you have a good neonatology unit. Two, you can do surgeries and can do it safely to the child with an obstetrician standby. At the worst case scenario, you don't want to use intraoperative imaging. You can use a long heart shield sublaminar in the lateral position. Hear what I've said. You could do a long heart shield sublaminar, decompress both the levels in a lateral position and get away with a good surgery. And it would probably work. But today, as I said, I would be dependent more on my AKT to work wonders, anti-cox to work wonders, which it does. But if there is a mechanical compromise, I shall decompress wherever there is, whether it is up and down, only up, I'm going to decompress it, but counsel the patient that this is something which I'm doing from the mechanical part. If the disease has gone, done an irreversible damage to neurology, it may not recover. Okay, sir. So uh, in the interest of time, I would like to show what we have done. So we have decided to go for the surgery. There are two problems. Like one, there's a problem with the position because of the flexion deformity. So we made this like uh, position for this our patient. So we have used these tools to uh, accommodate his both lower limb and, hi uh, and hip. So in this condition, and we decompress first of all lumbar in the same sitting, we decompress first lumbar region, dorsal lumbar spine. Then afterwards we get, went up to decompress the dorsal spine. Then this is a post-op x-ray for this patient. There's a lateral view for this patient. And uh, after doing decompression, this patient has relieved in the spasticity. Post-operatively, she has uh, relieved in the spasticity. And after four weeks, she started recovering. And, she, and by the latest follow-up, she has recovered some power, like three power, uh, power of three at his hip and knee she has got but still she's recovering and she's on ATT and we have uh, made uh, uh, we have started ATT as per his drug sensitivity essay this is a post of so my take home message for this patient we have to plan uh, and this patient depending upon the presence of medical comorbidities as the age of the patient and the location of the lesion and severity of the kyphosis and the numbers that are going to be affected and the lastly the experience and the preference of the surgeon depending upon that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, so far we don't have any questions. So we'll go ahead with the next speaker. Uh, that is Dr. Ajay Kothari. Uh, Dr. Ajay, can you share your screen? Yes. So over to you, Dr. Ajay. Hello, everyone. So I'm going to discuss a case of uh, thoracic tumor. So this is a 16-year-old male. He came with... Uh, in, in, inability to walk. He had gait disturbance since last 10 days. On examination, he had around grade 4 power in his both lower limbs and his uh, pain and fine touch was reduced. Joint position sense was preserved and he had hyperreflexia in both his lower limbs. This uh, was his x-ray uh, which didn't reveal much and this was his MRI scan. So if we see the MRI scan at the T8 level, we can see the body and the posterior elements getting involved. And there is a cord compression with cord edema, which is seen. I will first run through all the images. This is T1 weighted image. These are the coronal and the axials. We can see the body left ankle, the learning in the the right side. These are the images which are showing very classical fluid levels, multiple loculi and the fluid levels, contrast and the CT scan. So at this point of time, Agnivesh, your thoughts? Uh, yeah, primarily to me, it looks more like a benign lesion. It's involving more posterior elements and uh, posterior uh, uh, sort of a part of vertebral body engulfing. 
the contrast is in the periphery the central is not there the air fluid level suggests that this possibly could be a abc or the possibility of giant cell tumor is also there with this type of imaging those will be my first two preliminary diagnosis once i see those images of course i would like to confirm that with a biopsy before i do anything all right so uh, chabra sir i would like to have your thoughts so in this scenario where the child has started the uh, myelopathy which is a uh, short duration and patient has got a large lesion so would you go ahead and do surgery as well as biopsy at the same time or first stage you would do the biopsy confirm the diagnosis and then plan the definitive treatment chabra sir your thoughts yeah uh, can you quickly show what was the current neurological uh, uh, level yeah so, so the boy had uh, myelopathy he had an unsteady gait and he had around 3 to 4 power in both his lower limbs and hyperreflexia in both the lower limbs so he had gait unsteadiness but he was still walking so uh, if he was still walking a biopsy is a good option but what would be mandatory before you go in for a definitive procedure would be embolization right and uh, i would definitely uh, get a procedure done uh, see how vascular it is and embolize it and then within 24 hours of that go in for a definitive surgery but i would seriously consider a biopsy in this patient not that it may change my ultimate plan of management substantially but it's always better to confirm because the child is still a walker right and uh, we still have yeah, a substantial yeah. window period before which we could intervene all right so ram sir uh, now in this particular scenario as embolization comes with a big cost so do you discuss with the radiologist and uh, assess the level of vascularity or like you always go ahead with an embolization so i would just give you an preamble so in this case i discussed this case with the radiologist and they said that it doesn't seem to be highly vascular so we can still get away without an embolization in this case so my question to you ram sir is every case you would do embolization or you would consult the radiologist have their inputs and then take a take take a call okay two things before i answer that question i wanted to go back to the x ray because there's a very beautiful teaching point there this is a true winking owl sign that you see there when you said there's nothing on the x ray at d8 vertebra there's a very classical teaching point that you don't see one pedicle at all so that's an important point that you need to make let's go ahead now to answer your question uh, we have to understand that uh, we have to look at an ideal scenario and an ideal scenario would be discussing but in have a very low threshold to do a dsa or whatever and do a, a therapeutic embolization or a pre operative embolization i would like to make the patient and my life comfortable and if it, there is even some vascularity that i can reduce i would be happy doing it so i i do it as a routine ajay two things right yeah. one um, i have burnt my fingers before not embolizing and then having to terminate the surgery in between because you may never be able to anticipate just on the basis of radiology how vascular it is going to be and once you do an angiography you will see how it flares up right two okay. if i can reduce the tumor load by an embolization it okay. makes my life far more easier on the table both okay. these factors i think it is ultimately more cost effective if we go in for an embolization even if we need to get it from a government sector and then proceed further so okay okay so uh, agnivesh uh, how would you proceed with the treatment like assuming biopsy it says it's an aneurysmal bone cyst what next so uh, i would since the neurology is not very dense so we have some breathing space and uh, as chabra sir and ram sir suggested and i absolutely agree with them that i would take up this patient only after embolization only and once it is embolized 
then we'll do a decompression a sort of uh, curettage removal of whatever we can fill that anterior void with bone graft and stabilize it above and below that will be my plan for this patient all right so what we did was in this particular case uh, we used oam and navigation in this particular case so to begin with we did and after that we started the uh, stabilization as a first step so we stabilized level above and level below Ajay, consider switching off your video and speaking. Yeah, so this was the intraoperative. Doing a recording, one minute, guys. So we can see this is the recording. This is the cavity through which the curette is being inserted, and we are into the vertebral body. And this is the cord which has been decompressed. This is the wall of the cyst. That is the endothelial lining that we can see. And now we are curating into the vertebral body. And eventually, we'll pack it with bone graft. Thank you. Yes. So what we did was we stabilized at. The I think Ajay got disconnected. Yeah, he's back. He's back. Yeah, uh, Ajay, uh, you, if you can switch off your video and talk, that will be better. I think there is a network instability at your end. So you can just switch off your video and run your slides. That will be better. Please unmute yourself, Dr. Ajay. Ajay, you are on mute, Ajay. Ajay, you need to unmute. Ajay, please unmute yourself. Ajay, you need to unmute yourself. Can't hear you. Dr. Neeraj, can you unmute Dr. Ajay? Uh, yeah, and... Uh... Yeah, I'll ask uh, uh, Jignesh Bhai, can you unmute him? Hello, Jignesh Bhai, can you unmute him, please? Yes, sir. Yeah, unmute Dr. Ajay. Probably we get back. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, sorry, I tried uh, unmuting, but it was not happening uh, at my end. So what we did in this particular case was we stabilized two levels above, two levels below. We went in from the side, we curated out the cavity and packed in the bone graft in this particular case. And this child within three months uh, went on to have a complete recovery and the interval CT scan showed complete fusion and uh, the cyst which was there, the androsal bone cyst getting ossified completely. So this was my case. Any thoughts, seniors and dear colleagues? No, no. Good outcome. Only one thought. Please counsel these patients for recurrence, recurrence, recurrence. Okay. Right. Uh, Ajay, one question for you. Uh, yeah. This is regarding the OAM. Uh, a gentleman from Chennai, uh, Dr. Uh, C. Subramani, wants to know what is the exact cost of an OAM expense in the surgery which you have done? So, you mean the cost to the patient? Cost to the patient, right. Yeah, right. so the patient is charged 40,000 rupees extra for the OAM and navigation at our institute. Okay, 40,000 extra. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, so... So, any experience of... Uh, Denosumab in ABC to reduce the chance of recurrence? Uh, 
no i have uh, i look into the literature means denosumab in context to gct has been proven but uh, no first hand uh, uh, experience i think i need to look into the literature it i have not read about it or never it uh, is uh, a pro, it is uh, indicated the only thing is if it is a young child i am not very sure at this age but but it is abc can be treated with the uh, uh, uh with with denosumab and it reduces probably the recurrence rate also. right sir so literature says 18 years and above for denosumab in right. abc right right this guy is around 16 16 okay yeah okay thank you so much thank you thank you uh, i would now request dr mohinder sir to share his screen and uh, dr mohinder sir is going to speak upon a case on lumbar canal stenosis over to you sir speak kahan click karenge mukul ji Now it is not moving. So you need to uh, just minimize your screen and go back. Uh, on the first slide, you just need to go back on your first slide. Yeah, I will do that. Yes, sir. right sir yeah. uh, go back so go back you have to go on the first slide sir yeah so thank you jaidus and uh, ortho tv for this uh, opportunity for sharing Oh, uh, I think this is a uh, academic platform where we are able to interact and uh, gain knowledge about different uh, uh, disease entities which are affecting the spine. So I think I was asked to speak on lumbar canal stenosis. So straight away I will go on to the case presentation. I will not talk about epidemiology or uh, pathophysiology. So. my case is a 59 years old female reported with the low back pain and a bilateral leg discomfort from one year and her symptoms have especially leg symptoms have increased from last 3 months and his her vs back was 3 and leg was 6 slr was negative pulse is positive walking distance was about 200 meters uh, neurology was intact and uh, she was self guiding and uh, bilateral ehl was o plus she had undergone a root block with the some relief but uh, she primarily came for a further management how her neurological prodication can be taken care of so these are the dynamic x rays of the patient and this is a mri you can see there is a at l45 there is a predominantly a recess stenosis so i don't think there is any ambiguity or doubt among the panelists that uh, uh, these are the dynamic views this is mri i mean the it's a straight forward case where we know okay, what is the plan of action any of my colleague who will like to add anything before i proceed further i i i would only want to know if the patient has had a good conservative trial yeah doctor she was suffering from one year then in between she had a root blocks also about from she was coming to me from last 3 months right and uh, when she didn't settle down then she was counseled to go for a canal decompression and this is how we evaluated her we took her uh, uh, plain x rays and dynamic views and then mr mr uh, anything more you would like to know no no so uh, about management plan i mean uh, we all know that we have various techniques available today we have classical open technique and uh, we have microscopic decompressions and we have endoscopic decompressions 
So anything more my colleagues will like to add about uh, intervention or treatment part? So I mean, it is entirely a choice of a surgeon in whichever technique he's a master or he's trained or he has expertise, he can uh, choose that technique and go ahead. So I went in uh, for a endoscopic decompression and this was a arthrospine due UB technique. Nowadays, I mean, we all are hearing about because endoscopy, which uh, was uh, started in field of spine about say two decades now, it has come long way. Now people are uh, doing from simple discs to advanced endoscopic procedures, amounting to fusions and all that. So we planned simple decompression, midline and bilateral recess at L45. And I will briefly share the video also. The technique which we used as I already shared with you. So this is a brief video about the technique. About 10 to 12 millimeter incision with a stab knife. It is a skin and facial incision. Once you have marked the level under IHEV, then we use a set of dilators. This is a first dilator. It is a five millimeter dilator, which erases the, we target the spinal lamina junction. From there, we try to erase the muscle up to the facet joint. And this is a 10 millimeter dilator. Once we erase the muscles, then we slide in the uh, oval tube. This is a oval tube. And then this is the inside endoscopic view. The target here is we target the spinal lamina junction. You can see here that we have exposed the part of the lamina and this is surgery standing on the right side. This is a, from right side, we are approach, approaching this patient. Then we use a patchy with a small thread to keep the soft tissue away from the interlaminar window. Then we take few whites of the lamina at the spinal lamina junction. As you are seeing here, we do use birth to aid the, uh, at times, especially when lamina is very thick, we take a help of a bird to make it a little uh, thin, and then it makes job easier to take few further more bites with the carison punch. So flavum has been exposed now, you can see very clearly. And here again, once the flavum is uh, detached from the undersurface of the lamina, we put in a small patchy, so that flavum is uh, lifted up from the dura that prevents the inadvertent dural injury. And then bit by bit, with the help of carison punch, we try to remove the uh, flavum as you are seeing here with the, uh, we use three mm and two mm carison punches because the diameter of the tube is 10 millimeter. So when you're close to the surgical target, you have to switch over to a two millimeter carison punches. And uh, since this is a dual system, once we are close to the dura and the nerve roots, we switch over to a saline mode. Now, with the saline mode on, your clarity becomes better and the swelling of the scope tip is not there. And you can see the, appreciate the structures better. Your eye is virtually inside. You can, you are very close to a surgical target as you are seeing here that I have exposed the ipsilateral nerve root. I can see the disc very clearly, which is stable and uh, uh, nicely uh, yeah, you can see the even uh, axilla of the nerve root very clearly here. Now, this is the contralateral side, uh, contralateral side nerve root, which is again, uh, sorry, the disc, which is again a stable and it, it is maintaining its integrity. And there is a contralateral nerve root, you can see. Then the probing of the nerve root is there to see that adequate uh, foramen foram decompression is there. And this is the epsilateral nerve root. You can see here clearly shoulder and axilla. Again, you mobilize the nerve root. See that you have achieved a adequate decompression. This is a stable disc. So there's no need to add to additional uh, procedure like discectomy. So once the good decompression is achieved, the small incision, which is uh, skin and facial incision that is closed in a subcuticular fashion. And that is the end of the procedure, final decompression. So to summarize, lumbar 
spinal stenosis is a degenerative spinal condition characterized by the narrowing of the lumbar spinal canal due to a variety of bony or soft tissue structures. Diagnosis is made with MRI studies of the lumbar spine and treatment is a trial of non-operative management. As Dr. Chhabra asked me, these all patients are subjected to trial of non-operative management and they usually come to you after two or three years when symptoms, especially the neurological prodication is severe and interfering with the activities of daily living. That is a time that they report to you for surgical decompression. And that is a time when we go in and do the good decompression and results are really gratifying and good in these patients. Thank you very much. So, uh, any comments from the uh, panelists? Anyone, any comments? No, very nice surgery. Very well done. Clean and neat. Thank you, Dr. Shabla. <laughs> Uh, so one question is there for you, Mohinder sir, uh, yeah. from the audience. Uh, regarding the post-op protocol, uh, how long would you, I mean, uh, keep the patient in the hospital? Mobilization might be as early as possible, uh, but would you keep the patient for maybe a night or two? Or would you like to... Yeah, I mean, overnight hospitalization. Otherwise, these are daycare procedures. Patients are mobilized uh, about six, seven hours, hours after the procedure. And they stay overnight in the hospital and next day they are back home. Right. And so what about multiple levels? Your experience on multiple levels doing an MRI? I mean, uh, with this uh, tube, you can assess uh, two levels with one entry. If there are four levels, then you can make two entry ports. Right. So, yeah. Uh, any other questions from any of our panelists? Okay. So I think we'll go ahead with the next case. Uh, Dr. H.S. Chabra, sir, uh, uh, you can share your screen. And it's about a case of neglected scoliotic deformity. Over to you, sir. Can you see my screen well? Yes, sir. So, um, I took up this topic because this is also not very frequently discussed. Uh, just a brief uh, about when do we call a severe spinal deformity? If the Cobb angle of the main curve is more than 90 degrees in the coronal or sagittal plane, you call it a severe deformity. Uh, um, that is the expert consensus on this. Of course, you know what a rigid spinal deformity is. So the challenges in management of neglected and severe spinal deformity, since we have to stick to 10 minutes, I thought to, I bring it out for the benefit of the participants. One, the severity of the deformity. Two, the rigidity of the deformity. Three, the pulmonary compromise. Four, the associated intraspinal anomalies, which may be there. A compromised spinal cord, which may be there suboptimal nutritional status and possible associate, associated cardiac and renal anomalies in the congenital deformity. So these are the challenges which uh, you would face in management of neglected and severe spinal deformities. Uh, pulmonary compromise because uh, congenital scoliosis originates very early in embryonic life and may be associated with pulmonary bronchial and alveolar hypoplasia with rib anomalies that contribute to the reduction of the vital capacity. So then, in addition, the progressive thoracic scoliosis, and if there is lordoscoliosis, that adds to it. So there is a decreased ratio of anteroposterior to lateral thoracic diameter, which co correlates with the pulmonary dysfunction. Also, uh, we have to see that there may be a compromised spinal cord, and this adds further to the uh, challenge, especially this may not uh, um, tolerate any traction, intraoperative traction uh, procedure per se. So these uh, are the challenges that we uh, face in management in a nutshell. So coming to the case, this was a 33-year-old male, deformity over the back since birth, progressively increasing. Now the, he had difficulty in standing, breathlessness on exertion. Walking distance was hardly 200 meters. He had to sit down. He would pant for breath after that. There was no back pain, weakness of limbs or numbness. No bowel bladder involvement. So, and he had this restrictive lung disease along with this. So rest, everything, as you can see here, was fine. But there was a limb length discrepancy of 2.5 centimeters. Single breath count was 13. And we did a pulmonary function test and the FEV1 was 12%. So his pulmonary function was compromised. 
you can see the clinical pictures right you can see uh, uh, all the clinical pictures in this patient you can see how on the x-ray there was a severe deformity which was not only in the coronal place plane but also in the sagittal plane these are the right bending and the left bending views uh, so this was the traction films as you could see this was the push prone lateral film as you could see here and uh, these are the various measurements as you can see in this patient per se right uh, so we have a severe deformity you can see in the ct scan the 3d uh, uh, deformity which is there the mri revealed a split cord at one, at at a few levels which was there you can see the split cord here which and you can see that the vertebra is at 90 degrees right uh, per se and uh, uh further ct scan images as you go down and you can see how is it how it is horizontalized so there is a structural major right thoracic curve from t4 to t12 with the apex at t7 ap cob 97 lateral cob 68 so i'll come straight to the question how will you manage this case so agnivesh would you want to have a first go on this uh, uh thank you sir this is a, a very difficult situation especially because the person has grown into adulthood probably if they present younger they are easier to manage because the deformity is more flexible the compliance is good and they have better healing potential but if we have to manage this case i think the first foremost thing in my mind would be the pulmonary restriction and can we improve that pulmonary restriction before we pitch into sort of doing any type of work so whether uh, we uh, this patient will definitely need to be started on preoperative incentive spirometry with goal targeted increased maybe a repeat pft after a few days or weeks to understand if he is improving if i am looking at correcting this case i would uh, see that it's only a split cord malformation which is soft tissue or purely uh, sort of a cord sort of anomaly or, or there is some septum or something associated because that would have an impact on correction of deformity uh, this case uh, in all probability if we have to operate will need a sort of a Uh, a correction but if we can somehow consider this case for a preoperative halo traction or something like that it may sort of give make the final surgery much more easier uh, i am not sure whether we will be able to find out a level to do a vcr because the apex is at two levels one in the coronal and the sagittal apex are different Uh, probably if we uh, able are able to stretch this uh, deformity with a halo traction maybe we can do a fusion to prevent the worsening of curve and sort of let it stay that would also improve the pulmonary function and let him live a relatively better life so would you address the split cord before you go in for the surgery we have to operate because his progressively respiratory function is going he can hardly walk 200 meters so he will be confined soon to the bed right so there is no i don't think there's an option but to intervene in this patient right uh, but again that is open for discussion do we feel that the intervention will lead to stemming down the progression of uh, uh, the decreasing respiratory function or it may not have an effect but if you were to intervene would you address the split cord also and you said it would depend on various factors right yes if it's uh, a, if it's a septum or if it's just a duplication of cord with even duplication of dural sacs without any septum or anything i may not address that or think of doing that right right fine uh, dr shah yes, uh, what would your take be on this and uh, if you were to go in what would the strategies uh, you would use to ensure that there is a reasonably good outcome 
Uh, I agree with Dr. Agriway. So first of all, I would like to increase the pulmonary function for this patient. I would like to keep this patient on hello. And um, by this, I will be able to increase the lung function for this patient. And probably I there will be some stretching of the, uh, of your, of the column so that uh, I will be able to see better where uh, in the planning stage, where should I, uh, like uh, if you are planning for this rigid cup for the VCR, so I'll be able to see better uh, uh, after doing this, uh, after taking X-ray, uh, after giving this patient on halo, so I can plan a patient better after keeping this patient on halo. That would be better for my side. Uh, in, for initial few days, like three to four, uh, four to uh, six week or uh, halo traction, then get an X-ray, then see again how much the deformity is, uh, uh, how the deformity is behaving. And again, as already said, uh, this patient is also having intraspinal deform, intraspinal cord. Uh, uh, that would be also, I would like to take an opinion from Nero guys uh, for this, uh, uh, how to proceed for this thing. Fine. Dr. Mehinda Kaushal, anything to add to this or would you agree with what has been said? Are, Dr. Chabra, uh, scoliosis really not my cup of tea. Fine. So Fine. I am a spectator, right. quiet spectator listening to all of you right. on right. this topic. So right. I mean, I am just watching and listening to the discussion and enjoying it because Scoliosis, surely I have, um, I didn't have any training in scoliosis right. and I don't do scoliosis in my clinical practice also. Right. Right. Now coming, no, just the, uh, now either Agnivesh or Ajay or Dr. Shah. Now, do uh, you think you will be able to stem down the progression of the pulmonary function deterioration or do you think you will be able to uh, also gain in respiratory function if you operate at this age in 30s. So what, what are your takes on that? Uh, so I'll take that first. Yeah. Uh, sure. My first uh, question uh, back to Dr. Agnivesh is now there are two ways of using a halo. So some centers say that they would do a release first proper and then put a halo versus putting a halo without releasing. So what sort of, uh, you know, procedure you're thinking of like uh, release and then halo or directly a halo? So in this case, since the pulmonary function is very badly compromised, we will not be able to open up the chest and do a release and all. So ideal would be a release followed by an halo because it sort of uh, relaxes the joints. It has also been documented that probably giving a halo traction without releasing the spine can cause a stretch on the cord more and lead to deficit. But in this case, I would not think of uh, releasing the thing. If, if, if at all, I uh, sort of think it would be a posterior release with a limited uh, sort of uh, release to sort of gain some SS, make some mobility, make some inway into the, do, do the pontes, do the facets, maybe distract the disc spaces a bit. But I don't think it's possible to go anterior in this deformity and do a proper anterior release. Yeah. So uh, my thought in this case was, I think the split cord that we're looking at, I think with the neuromonitoring, in place and anyways we are going to shorten the column so i would not really think about doing much to the split cord because i think it would add to the problems uh, if we address that so if i have to treat this case i think uh, uh, the most ideal would be releasing from the back putting screws giving patient the time closing it putting a halo and coming back after few weeks stretch it out and i think then do the osteotomy and then correct the deformity and in addition add costoplasty i think here the chest is uh, the major concern over cosmesis so after doing the pvcr from the back shortening the column i would also add costoplasty procedure in this particular patient and treat it so uh, just just some uh, questions here now uh, uh, with a compromised pulmonary function right? Uh, that would add to the risk of anesthesia also and the patient being on a ventilator subsequently. So uh, we have tried it either way but uh, if just adding the halo tends to improve pulmonary function as it's well reported in the literature, you may want to first put in a halo and see if it helps with the pulmonary function and if it doesn't, you could then go in for a release per se. Right, and Agnivesh, your point of the halo leading to deterioration in cord function, actually, 
you are doing that awake and you are not doing that suddenly so with that gradual distraction which takes place even if there is a deficit you are able to monitor and you could stop it there and then so awake traction does not is not as much a matter of concern as traction intraoperatively and as I, as ajay very rightly said during the surgery you will never do a distraction you would only do a, a, a shortening of procedure now uh, uh, dr uh, shah do you have anything to add or can we go straight to ram go to so no sir nothing so ram are you there yes sir so how would you manage this uh, case and what would your strategies be sir i would totally agree with the part that you would probably need to admit this patient for quite some time maybe even 2 to 3 weeks and put him on a, a sort of gradual halo and let him walk around and just sort of be around with him and reach an optimal sort of point where you can intervene by which time hopefully his chest function would improve and you could plan your strategy better strategy wise most of the points which have been mentioned by ajay i would concur with and uh, we would need to actually take a lot of decisions on table based on where we are with the imaging post halo and then go ahead as regards whether we are addressing the the cord anomaly at the same time a lot would depend as agnivesh said whether it's a static osseous anomaly or it is something that can be left for the time being that's how i would go ahead thanks dr ram uh, very well summarized we also had told him accordingly but we also very often sent people back home on a halo halo gravity or after release a halo pelvic also and teach them how to serially distract it gradually and monitor the neurology also in this particular case also we had planned accordingly we uh, had a gradual uh, awake halo gravity traction and correction and uh, uh, we you can see here with the halo the uh, uh, single breath count increased and the fev1 also increased and uh, you can see how with halo traction the deformity improved over a few days only within a week we were surprised also with this right so it had reduced already from 97 to 69 degrees right so rather than sending him back home or further doing it we went in for a definitive surgery we did a vcr we did a shortening we did did a, uh, a correction of the deformity uh, you can see this is the post operative uh, uh, you can see the pre op and the post op uh, you the, the rotation we were not able to correct as much uh that is why you can see the direction of the screws at 90 degrees again but we were able to correct the deformity reasonably as as would be evident from these pics that you can see and uh, from these pics that you can see and uh, this is the one year follow up in this patient and you can see that the final corps angle was 47 degrees kyphosis 42 degrees single breath count improved gradually and uh, we now the patient is even participating in a ma in marathons right so this this is uh, this is a very good outcome and we are in the process of publishing whereas there is this uh, there is published literature and we have also published other cases with split cords also with a bony septum where because you do an intraoperative only shortening so you don't need to address that before the surgery there it's also documented in the literature we have also published it in this case also we did only a intraop shortening even though with the halo while awake we had uh, uh, done distraction and uh, we were able to achieve a, 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 a reasonable correction again for the benefit of the patients all this needs to be done only under neuro monitoring per se so you can see how the fev1 gradually increased from 12% to 42% from single breath count from 13 to 
So just for the benefit of the participants, some strategies that we always use, use a multidisciplinary approach. In the benefit of time, I'll not go into details. Build up the patient's general condition, BMI. Careful pre-op evaluation should be done by the anesthetic. Anesthetist, build up the respiratory reserve, which is very important. Frame goals of management carefully, taking into consideration the severity and the challenges and discuss these goals and possible complications with the patient and family. Use preoperative and post-release traction to achieve correction. Stage the procedures, right? Especially because there is a pulmonary compromise. Use of any traction for a correction should be only awake and controlled, either pre-op or after release. A neurology should be monitored. Intraoperative neuro, neuro monitoring is a must. Severe and rigid spinal deformities should be made supple with anterior and or posterior release with or without osteotomies. And you can do all this just from the posterior approach. You can do a thorough anterior release, especially since in these deformities, you, they have, there is a substantial rotation. You can do the anterior release also from posterior only. And some of the surgical strategies which can be used during the procedure, including anterior release, posterior disc release, uh, internal traction, etc. Deformity can be corrected without removal of diastomatomalia and ensure a very good intraoperative and postoperative monitoring and management. So these are some of the strategies that we use. Uh, these are, of course, very challenging surgeries, but the successful outcome after planned surgical treatment is a life-changing event, as you could see in this patient, with improvement in thoracic height, pulmonary function, and a profound effect on cosmosis and self-image as well. So I would be happy to take any questions if there is time for that. So yes, thank sir. you for your patience. Right, sir. Right. So there is one question for you. Yes. Uh, it is regarding, in this particular case, how did you go about the post-op monitoring and how frequently were you following up with the patient? So post-op monitoring, we uh, means we have to because the patient did not have any neurological deficit and he had improved with pulmonary function. So we rehabilitated the patient and within five to six days, we sent the patient back home. But we had told him about the red flags and we had counseled him about the importance of uh, 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 chest uh, exercises, also gradually building up his walks and a good rehabilitation program. And we also have a tele-rehabilitation, so we are able to follow them very well. And uh, uh, of course, our protocol is we call them after three months, six months, one year. But in this patient, we had to call him also more frequently because of uh, respiratory function monitoring. Sir, can I ask a question? Sure, sure. Sir, uh, apart from neuromonitoring, did you use intraoperative OAM navigation or robot or any other things? Because I think it's a great correction and uh, anything to aid apart from neuromonitoring. No, we got the robo after this case was done around five years ago. We got the robo after that. Now we have got the OAM as well. We initially decided to go in for the robo and then now we have the OAM. But uh, this, see, uh, I think I feel that with the current robo, in deformities especially, in severe deformities, it is still a challenge with the robo. Good landmarks and following the good anatomy and principles of spine surgery, you can do it well. And you have to just follow the principles. But uh, uh, a reasonable correction took place just with the halo traction before, even without a release. And we did an osteotomy intraoperatively and did a shortening in order to improve on that. Excellent. Great Thank, job. You, sir. Thank you. Excellent, sir. Thank you. So now we go on to our last case. Uh, I would request Dr. Uh, Ramchandra sir to share his screen. And we have a very interesting topic from his end, how to deal with an unhappy patient. Over to you, sir. Good evening, friends. Um, you've seen some fantastic surgical exposition by my colleagues. And we've seen the best of us at the best of times being very unhappy because our patient is unhappy with us. I share with you what I have learned over the past 30 odd years, dealing with people, trying to make them less unhappy. 
after a spine surgery. We've also noticed today that patients are giving vent to their discomfort and unhappiness at the cost of doctors as well as hospitals or nursing homes. And we are facing the brunt of this dissatisfaction in society. Let's look at a situation like this. We have an unhappy relative of a patient who has had a post-operative adverse event. He barges into your very packed clinic in the evening. You've operated him in the morning. The relative comes to you in the evening and wants to be seen immediately by you. This is what the relative looks like. Would you stop your present consult and see him right there? Would you finish your present consult and see him later right there? Would you politely have him seated in another room and see him after the present consult? Would you admonish him and get your support staff to make him wait outside? Dear friends, many of us may succumb to A or B. A few of us may have the guts to use option D. But what I feel is that we should politely have him seated in another room and see him after the present consult. Give it some time. Most of the times, the unhappy patient is out of focus and it is the disgruntled relative, caregiver, who is looking at us and making us more unhappy. There's a mindset malfunction. Patients see doctors as predators and themselves as preys. We doctors see patients as predators and ourselves as preys. Why is this happening today? Time to stop, think, pause, reconsider. Why is the patient unhappy? Have we given it a thought? I have, and I believe there is a dichotomy. Diagnosis that we achieve is based on suspicion, doubt, skepticism, which means we are suspecting something. This is exactly opposite of what we want for treatment, which is truthfulness, transparency, and empathy. And finally, we expect from the patient who has to heal, faith, belief, and trust. As Robert Owen has been said, and I would quote him, God and the doctor we alike adore, but only when in danger, not before. The danger over, both are alike requited. God is forgotten and the doctor slighted. Yes, we have all faced these. Why does this happen? Well, healing is the purpose Treatment is the process and diagnosis only a product. We should look at the purpose. We have to give back with a helping hand. Please understand, we may receive scars, assaults and abuses, but we still need to be compassionate, empathetic and caring. India is not the only country. More than 100 healthcare workers died between 1980 and 1990 in the USA as a result of violence. 75% of doctors in India have faced some violence or the other at work. We've had this prevention of violence in Medicare as an act. It's notified in 19 states for the past 10 years. However, we don't have an FIR which is filed by a doctor or lodged by a doctor, and we tend to have compromises out of court. Why is this happening? Why are we being assaulted? It's the poor image of doctors in the media. There are a few black sheep, but we are neither of them. We are neither sheep nor black. Healthcare is expensive. There's inadequate security in small centers. Today, everybody has this, this instant gratification sort of a need. 
there's a mob mentality there's impatience unrealistic expectations and something where we need to look improper communication and consenting how can we prevent this violence one we should avoid media sensation of deaths we should not allow media to sensationalize any death legal steps should be taken and legal steps should reach a level where a patient's complaint should be cancelled if there is a proof of violence by patient or kin what else should we do be realistic don't overreach in your prognosis take valid informed consent do a detailed written documentation be empathetic in your communication be always alert of a potential violence what are the types of violence we face telephonic threats intimidation verbal abuse physical non injurious assault yes physical assault simple or grievous even murder vandalism and arson at your workplace how does it affect us we get depressed we lose our sleep we get post traumatic stress we have fear and anxiety absenteeism from work a few of us even commit suicide indicators of violence there is an acronym called stamp if the patient or the relative is staring at you continuously it's an early potential indicator if there's an increase or a change in the tone or volume of the voice if there's an increased anxiety in the patient and the family if there is a lot of mumbling and incoherent speech that's going on and if there's a pacing around the doctor waving arms please look at it as a potential threat to you what are the sops that you need to follow restrict entry to your hospital ensure yourself ensure your establishment have mock drills with color code how do you manage an adverse event remain calm depute a photographer or a videographer photocopy all your medical records inform a lawyer inform the police maintain a recording of the call to the police what else should you do identify the leader of the mob there's usually one trouble maker get written consents and statements from witnesses who are not necessarily related to that family lodge an fir with the police specifically under relevant act to protect medical personnel do not settle by paying any hush money because that is taken as an admission of guilt in the court of law when all this is going on still be charming and correct remember to follow dr guliana's advice he's a recognized speaker and speaks on medical practice all over the world says do the right thing meticulously document any conflict never lose your temper stay out of danger never be distressed by insistent patients investigate the patient's mental state do not shirk difficult patients essential patient communication skills open and frank communication with the patient it's a creative art which can be developed throughout your medical career communication skills is a long life pursuit soft skills should be incorporated in our curriculum as training as young students and young undergraduate and postgraduate doctors all of us do not have equal talent but all of us have an equal opportunity to develop our talents soft skills need to be developed we have to practice both advice and counseling two thirds of these problems do not need pharmacology they only need advice and counseling mental health consultations are common and these are essential for such patients depression of the past and anxiety of the future are very common problems nothing in the world bothers you more than your own mind in fact others seem to be bothering you it's not others it's your own mind what are the nine components of effective communication listen to your patients respect their views have an open communication of all treatment preferences discuss each management option 
allow patients to ask all questions. Ensure that they've understood. Be aware of their language. Accept all cultural influences and compensate for their communication skills. You may be a doctor, he may be a patient, but remember, he's neither above you nor are you above them. Never above you, never below you, always besides you. Share the responsibility. The best form of service is to uplift somebody's mind and state of mind. We should also have excellent non-verbal communication. Have a shared understanding, an open attentive posture, have a good eye-to-eye -eye contact, active listening, keep nodding, encourage the patient to tell their stories without interruption, ask open-ended questions which bring out additional concerns. Please remember, the mind is a beautiful servant, but it's a very dangerous master. Common sense is not a gift, it's a punishment if you have to deal with everyone who doesn't have it. And if you're really stuck with somebody, remember, tough times never last, tough people do. If you're going through hell, just keep going. Be optimistic. Please remember, what the mind conceives, the heart believes and the body can achieve. Beware of your thoughts, they'll become words. Beware of your words, they'll become actions. Beware of your actions, they'll become your habits. Habits will become your character and character will soon become your destiny. Please understand that we as doctors, as clinicians, don't have to just look, but we have to see. We don't have to just hear, but listen. We don't just touch, but we should feel. Get out of your head and get into your heart. Think less and feel more. Never show pity, show compassion. You should not feel sympathy, but empathy. You must equate yourself to the patient's agony. And remember, truth and transparency in all our understanding with the patient builds trust. This is the last session. This is the last presentation and probably the most important slide for today. Remember, we all practice. I have been doing for the last 30 years plus. Don't practice for income, but for outcome. Time to move from knowledge to wisdom. Wisdom is removing the useless knowledge that you may have. Move from selfishness to selflessness to altruism. Whatever you do should be the good of society directly or indirectly. Move from just getting information to reformation to transformation. Move from becoming a caterpillar only and evolve from a caterpillar to a butterfly. Don't just do your duty, find your calling. Move from yoga joke to sanjo, connect with the patients. Don't just do your duty, natakriya. It's time to do karma. That's when you'll move from treatment to healing. The mission of your life should be to leave this world better than what you had inherited. Remember that each day. Despite that, you may still fail. Remember, ever tried, ever failed, no matter. Try again, fail again, fail better. And if you go back 100 years, this gentleman called Fitchcock Nansen, he got a Nobel Peace Prize in 1921. What did he say? He was a Norwegian explorer. He said, the difficult is what takes a little time. The impossible is what takes a little longer. Just be there. Be yourself. We don't live in a perfect world. We should be happy to accept our imperfections and set the world right. Make a dent in the world and leave it a better place than what we inherited. Thank you all for a very patient hearing. Excellent, sir. Excellent talk. Uh, and so we have a very interesting question actually for you. Uh, it's a question pertaining to counseling. So how much time do you really spend with your patient to counsel, especially when you're going to take him up for surgery? Because I think that is the most important part and the uh, section of your entire talk, I think. So how much time do you really spend, sir, on this? I'll be very frank with you. Um, if I execute a micro lumbar discectomy, 
and do the essential part of the surgery between 30 to 40 minutes. I probably have spoken to that patient and the family at least for three hours before I've taken up the patient for surgery. Not the day before, but probably when I counseled them the first time, the second time that they came in. In fact, my entire informed consent is not taken at the time of admission. It's discussed prior. They are even given a copy of the informed consent to read. And then they come back with any additional questions. I tell my patients that there is no question that should be coming to you as a surprise. You can ask me anything and everything. And I am far more comfortable consenting them for everything before I move ahead. I am a little bit of a stickler for that because I sleep better at night. If whatever happens to the patient, good, bad or ugly, is discussed with the patient preoperatively. I spend too much time on counseling and, I, and I, I sort of, I'm guilty of that. I'm sorry about that. Actually, this is one of the most important things. Actually, that, that is what we've been taught when we were postgraduates. Sir, any comment from any of the panelists? Uh, Chabra, sir? Yeah, I think uh, that is the most important uh, part of the whole, uh, I think, session, what Ram addressed. I think whatever, we may do wonderful surgeries. The outcomes may be also good. But what are the expectations that you have set to the patient? Right. If you have not set them right, you may still end up with a very unhappy patient. So uh, you have to set the expectations proper. You have to be good with communication skills. You have to be frank and transparent with the patient and the attendants if something bad happens or if some adverse effect is there. Uh, I think uh, these are things which are not taught to us uh, during our training or are not available in the textbooks and thus they assume more importance. So thanks Ram for this wonderful um, uh, means advice to all of us and especially to our young colleagues who may be watching from across India. Thank you. Mohinder sir, your comments? No, I think the message is very crisp and clear that counseling is a tool. If you have counseled the patient properly, your half of the problems are solved. If something happens post-op and you have not shared that uh, knowledge with the patient, patients are then, uh, they become troublemakers. So, as Dr. Ram has mentioned, I mean, he spent three hours. That's a hell of a lot of time. I'll be very honest with you. Usually, we have a counselor. I mean, I do my surgical part counseling. Then other things are there which are done by a counselor. But surely, I mean, I surely don't give three hours time uh, as the, uh, Ram is telling me. But uh, since my bulk of uh, surgical spine surgery is uh, same, Microlumbar discectomies or endoscopic discectomies and canal decompressions. So I do spend about 20 to 30 minutes during first visit and tell them what are the complications, what will be the outcome, what will be the post-op uh, protocol and all that. But uh, I think Dr. Ram's talk is uh, need of the hour and all the uh, youngsters. In fact, I feel ki this is a subject which we don't discuss or don't talk during our uh, medical training. And this is high time that we start talking about these, uh, this aspect also. And I think such kind of presentation should be part of the medical curriculum to my mind. I think you become a better doctor. You become, uh, as uh, Dr. Ram has mentioned, that uh, if you proper advise and counseling is half of the battle one. And when the complication is known to the patient, patients that don't react that violently. If we don't talk to them, we promise them a moon. The problems happen when... You promise them a moon and something happens, then patients are after you. They start creating trouble. So we have a long journey. Like I have also 35 years of practice. And this is what we have learned. That have a sit with the patient, have a good discussion, open discussion. Then surely things are under control if something goes wrong. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Dr. Agnivesh, your comments? No, I think uh, it is absolutely amazing to hear Ram, sir. And with Ram sir presenting the same thing, it becomes multiplied and multifold. So it is very important. I think as already stressed, it needs to be part of curriculum incorporated in all the medical subjects, rather at the MBBS level only, uh, rather than speciality training. And of course, we, we try to do our best, but 
we cannot achieve 100% and when we have discussed all of this as sir said you sleep better at night and i think that's the most important thing which matters like you should have a sound sleep you should have a contented sleep that you have done the right thing uh, that i think that's the most important thing that you sleep well at night it means you are truth you are honest and you are truthful i think that's what matters absolutely yeah dr ajay your comments Ajay, uh, uh, Dr. Shah Valiula, your comments? Excellent talk by Dr. Ram sir. As always, he delivered the best thing to us. I have learned previously such kind of things from, and so what I feel like uh, that there are so many things to learn from Dr. Ram sir. Uh, uh, even uh, these non-academic talks. Though these uh, talks have been incorporated uh, in the recent curriculum, they have been taken by our MCI in 2000, from 2019 batch onward. But the speaker like Dr. Ram sir, who is going to deliver in such a beautiful way, they have been here. And really awesome talks sir, from your side. There are a lot of things, like counseling and uh, this concern. They are so much important uh, part uh, from our surgical point of view. But still, as in our government uh, uh, setup, we are not able to give so much time, but there is no excuse for these things. And we need to give time and we have to take out some time for this thing uh, before operating, before touching even for this patient uh, doing surgery. Well, thanks a lot, sir, for a nice, brilliant talk, sir. Right. <laughs> Yes, sir. Thank you. So I think uh, we will uh, close the session now and I would just like to thank all our faculty and the panelists for this excellent session what we had in Spine Symposium uh, and the most important part we've crossed uh, registrations of over 2,500 participants today so this was an excellent uh, gathering and uh, as you know the third wave we hope it doesn't come in and you just expect that everyone should be safe and sound and obviously the academics must go on. So on behalf of Zydus Sinovia and Ortho TV, I would like to thank all the participants as well as our all delegates and the faculty for joining us today for this session. Thank you, sir. Thanks, sir. Thank you very much. Good night, sir. Stay safe. Stay happy. Thank you.